So, good morning. For those who don't know me, my name's Chris. And yeah, I'm talking about Gospel Communities on Mission. So I'm just going to recap what we've looked at over the last month. Um, Chris Tatchell spoke to us about being the church. It's not a building, but it's us as the people of God. Amy spoke on the purpose of the gospel, how we're called to share the good news, even though we can have bad days and we don't really have everything sorted. Simon spoke about how discipleship involves using our heart, head and hands. And Jordan spoke how discipleship is an everyday part of our life, not just when we're focusing on God on a Sunday morning. So before I dig in too deep, I wonder what image comes into your head when I say the word evangelist? What do you think of? Perhaps you think of a person on their own. They're talking about what they believe in, the, in public. Maybe they're Christian, maybe they're not. It could be someone promoting veganism, for example. In my mind, it's a person trying to persuade you to join their side. They're talking at length about why they think you need what they've, what they've got. But let's have a look at what, so we'll turn to Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 9. And I'll read that now. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on, the ha on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered you. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Well, does that picture sound like the picture you had of evangelist? It doesn't for me. Here, Jesus is giving us something different. Nobody goes at it alone. The disciples are sent out in pairs. This is a consistent theme across the New Testament. It's very obvious when you read the book of Acts. We see very few going out on mission on their own. Here, Jesus mentions the 72, there's the 12, Peter and John, Barnabas and Saul, Paul and Timothy, and many more. I think one of the reasons why is John 13, 35. And that goes, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. It's hard to demonstrate that on your own. Another thing I noticed about this passage is there's, there's no sermon. There's no need for public speaking. That could be an opportunity for me to stop right there. Done. No need. But what is needed? Well, the disciples are told to go there, to, to be with people, eat with them and simply let them know that God is close to you. Well, if none of the rest of my talk has any impact, I pray that you hear me now. The kingdom of God has come near to you. It was about a year ago now that Richard and Catherine first joined us here in Twerton, and they're a wonderful example of how to love and be a family. I remember that date because it was as Lucy and I, we went away. Richard and Catherine were joining St. Michael's family as we were saying to Tar for now, going travelling. We missed you all at St. Michael's terribly and every Sunday we could find a church, we would remember the community spirit we had here. We were very blessed by, though by some amazing examples of community that we saw when we went to church. In Lithuania we found, by searching online, a church that had some English text. It wasn't only Lithuanian, which we can't speak. And we decided to check it out. There was a lady there who named, named Rasa, and she was so kind and generous to us. She sat behind us the entire service, 
and translated everything for us just by whispering into our ears. Afterwards, she invited us out for lunch with her and another young family, giving us a guided tour around the town. We've been longing for some company. And she asked to meet us, and we asked to meet up again later in the week. She showed us around a local park, invited us into our home. We had great chats and having that connection was a real blessing to us. And we were able to bless her too, as she felt refreshed and energized by our companionship. I don't know about you, but I'm often put off evangelizing because of that picture in my head that I spoke about earlier. It feels like I've got to be a salesman for God, trying to sum up all that he is for other people to gain interest. And if I don't get people to sign on the dotted line, well, I failed. But what if being on mission is more about raising awareness? What if all we have to do when on mission is exactly what we're trying to do all the time, to follow God, live in his presence, and just acknowledge that this is what we're doing. The disciples are told to just go and be with people. And if someone promotes peace, then they're to stay there and be with them. What does that phrase promote peace mean? They're who the disciples were seeking, so, so we should probably look out for those people too. Are we looking out for people who aren't warmongers? They had a peace sign in their window? I looked at a few other translations. The Amplified translation, it says, someone who is sweet-spirited and hospitable. The message translation goes like this. When you enter a home, greet the family. Peace. If your greeting is received, then it's a good place to stay. But if it's not received, take it back, get out. Don't impose yourself. The disciples aren't going to get people to join their team, though I'm sure they would welcome anyone who asked to join. They go to bless people in their everyday lives. And rather than seeking converts, they just want to talk about the gospel and see who's interested. That connection, those relationships which are life-giving, those friendships where it's just easy, are the ones where we have a real opportunity to share the gospel. There was a time when we were traveling, when we were in Moscow, and Lucy and I were in a kitchen at this hostel eating dinner. We'd cooked up plenty to create leftovers for the next day, but we had so many other people who weren't eating, we decided to offer out our food and share it. It was one of those times and those conversations that just keeps going. It went on far longer than we expect. There was a great positive vibe. Other people were joining in. We got to share deep personal stuff and the conversation moved to faith. Lucy and I mentioned that we're Christians and we're heading to church on Sunday and we ask if anyone wants to join us. A few say no, though they're Christian, and one of the guys from India, Anchov, says yes. He's not a Christian, he's exploring his faith and he wanted to try out a Christian service for the first time. So we have a very strange experience. We go to an Anglican church in the capital of Russia. Most signs around are in Russian, so you can't read them. And there we find this typical brick building. It's got a Union Jack flying outside. And inside, it's fancy Anglican robes, really high church. Very fancy, not like St. Michael's at all. But we go to this service and Anjov and I stay afterwards for a light lunch before walking back to the hospital. Yeah, hospital. He didn't really seem wowed. And at the time I felt like I'd failed. I got one person to come along to church and that hadn't quite been what I wanted. But on reflection, I see this as a success. Lucy and I spoke openly about our faith and honestly, and although not everyone wanted to pursue it further, we acknowledged God. The church service wasn't quite my style, but God was there. And God will have been working in Anchov's heart in some way. God's going to do more work in him. All I did was start something. Jesus goes on from this mission description. In verse 16, he says, Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Jesus is saying that we are like him. We're reflections of him and we shine his light just by being. Now Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. 
he was himself a reflection of his father in heaven and we are all created in the image of god and that word image can mean reflection so let's just i'm just going to say that again every human being you've ever known was created in the likeness of the creator of the universe the lord of all our loving father Sadly, no one of us is a perfect reflection. We sin, we mess up. We go our own way, choosing to rule our own life and not follow our Father. Jesus came that we may be reconnected to God the Father via the Holy Spirit and that we may be forgiven. By following Christ, we are actively trying to transform ourselves into Christ's likeness again. Last time I spoke on the church being the body of Christ, with each of us having different gifts. I think we also have a different understanding and revelation of God. I'm a work in progress. I don't know it all. So I can only be a flawed teacher. I don't know God fully. Can anyone? <laughs> but by doing this together, by going on mission together, we can each share what we know about God. And we can be honest and vulnerable about our own struggles. The pressure on us to have all the answers is off, it's gone. We're not pointing to our own understanding, but we're shining a light on Jesus, who is perfect. I wanted to read something by James Finley from the Centre for Action and Contemplation. And this explores the idea of the image of God. I think it's quite funny and profound. Um, if you don't have a full length mirror to hand, maybe a webcam will do the job. Imagine you're just standing before a full length mirror and imagine the image of you is conscious, but it can think. And this image of you has been through a lot of therapy. It's taken a lot of courses on being an insightful image. And it's come to a point in which it informs you that it doesn't need you. You say to the image of you, well, you know, this is gonna be rough, really, since you are an image of me. No, 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 the image says, I've worked on this. I've come to this point. Well, so to gently help the image out, you step halfway off the side of the mirror and half the image disappears, but the image has a panic attack. It goes back into therapy and it says to the person, I'm not real, I'm not real. I was working on my affirmations. I bolstered up my confidence, but I don't know where I went. I buckled. Now the image was real, but not in the way that it thought it was. It was not real without the one it was reflecting. I wonder this morning how you feel as a reflection of God. I'm certainly not feeling like a perfect copy. I'm a bit of the partial image, part reflecting him well, part not. And that's okay as God is still revealing himself to me through his word, through prayer, and the lives of people around me. I'm still being transformed into his likeness. But I know that unquestionably, without doubt, I am made in the image of God. I know there's some good stuff in this talk today, and that's not because of me, because I'm reflecting him. By being these gospel-centered missional communities together, we can reflect God's glory more fully. I'll say again that the thing that Jesus told his disciples to say, the kingdom of God is close to you. Together, let's take this good news of God's transforming power Acknowledge how God is working us and display it for the world to, to see. I'm going to finish by moving into a time of prayer. And I just wanted to finish by asking a couple of questions. Uh, number one, what good is God doing in your life at the moment that you could praise him about? Maybe there's something you're really thankful to God for, or possibly you're in the middle of a trial and you're having to lean on God really hard at this time. And number two, are there people in your life who you click with, you've got that relationship, but you've not yet acknowledged God to, you've not had, just seen if they're interested. Who do you have those deep, meaningful chats with? And how can you bring God up in that conversation? 